Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. of clay have come before you this morning yielded and willing to be formed by you into the shape that you'd have us to be. And as we recognize that in ourselves we can do nothing, you can do everything. And to that, Lord, we give you praise. Lord, your marvelous plan of salvation snatched us from the flames of hell and set our feet on a rock and set us aright. Lord, we stumble, yet we, we struggle, and in our struggle you help. Help us always to remember, Lord, that you were at arm's length, always. Your son gave his all for us. What else can we do but give our all to you? Father God, glory be to your name. Yes. Yes. Lord, you have done mighty things some of them we have seen, and mightier things we have not seen. But it all demonstrates that you, Lord, are, have absolute power. Yes. You have absolute authority. And you, Lord, are righteous above all else. Lord, we've come into this service this morning seeking your face. Help us, Lord, to be molded today. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged. Help us, Lord, to be lifted up today. Because of that's what your will is for us. That we be healthy and whole. And everything that you have done has set our life in that direction. May we be accommodating, Lord, by being obedient to each call that you have put on us. And as our pastor comes this morning to share from your word, not only, Lord, would our minds be attuned to what you have for us, but also maybe our hearts be receptive as well. Help us, Lord, to implement the things that you have put at our feet to put to use. And we, Lord, these lumps of clay will be very, very careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for it all. We pray expecting things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you'll turn in your Bibles with me, back to where? First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Good, you're paying attention. We like that. Okay. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 3 we are still in. Uh, we'll be in that chapter this week and yet again next week. Um, but we are going to be starting at verse 10 and reading through verse 17. So now we're continuing our discussion on credible Christianity. Uh, last week we got a chance to hear about that credible Christ that we serve. 
uh, that deserves us to be credible as much as we can be. Um, and how many know though that you're gonna fall short? You know, oh, yeah. we're, we're gonna mess up. We're not gonna be able to do it. And I know in conversations with dad throughout this week, the word that has resonated in my mind uh, over and over again, as he has shared is, you know what, we can't do anything. We can't even worship unless Jesus sources us. Right. And we need to realize that he is our source. If we're gonna be credible at all, it's only gonna be as we surrender to him day in and day out. Two weeks ago, you know, we talked about, well, three weeks ago, we talked about wisdom. You know, Paul went into how great a precious gift the wisdom of God is. But then he went in and started the spankings two weeks ago. As he said, yeah, I'd like to be able to share that stuff with you, but I can't do it because, you know, frankly, you're not grown up enough to be able to receive it yet. And, um, but that his desire was that they get there. It wasn't a uh, condemnation, but it was definitely a stern rebuke, wasn't it? And, but today, it's not quite so bad, okay? It, it could be a little later this week, but I want us to pick up starting at verse number 10. And he starts off there stating this. He said, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, take time now to, to chew on your word, as, as we choose to take it into our very souls, Lord, would you speak your words? Would you deliver us, deliver unto us the nourishment, Lord, of your word that you would desire us to have to help us to grow and become more mature and more credible, Lord, in our walk with you. And we give you honor, we give you praise in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So there's a lot in this section. But I guess if I had to start off, I would want to ask you simply this. How are you investing your time? How are you investing your time? I mean, that, in, in a nutshell, that's really what this passage is trying to get people to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to get us to this point of, look, take a good hard look at where you're at, what it is you're doing, and is it having any true significance? Of course, how do we measure that significance? It's not in worldly standards. No. You know, you do not measure success in God's kingdom the way the world measures success. And the way the world measures it is how much money do you have in the end and how big is it, right? But that's not the way God measures it. If it was that way, there's a lot of Old Testament prophets that were total failures <laughs> because they preached and they had no fruit from their labor. But yet they did have fruit because their fruit was in their obedience to Christ. And so that is really in a nutshell what it is trying to get at in this passage. So that's kind of the, the aerial view, if you will, of this. But now what I want to do is I want to really kind of hone in a little bit on this. And begin to take a good look and, and see what kind of qualifications it gives us or the sorts of things that we should be considering if we are going to live lives that are credible in the sight of God. See, because credible Christianity isn't determined by me. It's not determined by your pastor. It's not even determined by social media or even by the traditional media. It's not determined by the great evangelists of the world. The way that true... Um, Success and whether or not we are really investing our time the way God wants us to is determined by him and him alone. That's right. And so the way we, we're going to understand it is to really dive into how do we figure that out? How do we understand that? Are there things that consume your time that steal away from eternal value? That, that steal away from having eternal results? And do you spend more time on yourself rather than the Lord? 
You know, those, those are some really big questions for us to ask. And the answers to these questions say a lot about what happens in the end, which he begins to lay out there when he talks about how we build upon the foundation. Matthew 6, verse 19 tells us this. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But, or rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And in other words, the things that you invest in in the kingdom of God are things that will not fade away. They have, they have everlasting value. Even, even ministries that, that kind of come, that begin and end. And, you know, I, my dad, I've learned a lot more of that as he went through his years of retirement. There are seasons that come and go. But you know what? The fruitfulness of those labors continue. Yes, it does. And will remain. And we need to understand that. That it's just because what we see in the flesh goes by the wayside doesn't mean that it's done. God is still using it. God is still working it. God expects us to be good stewards of our times, of our talents, and of our treasury. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it tells us this, Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So we need to make sure that we are discharging what it is God wants us to do. He needs to be the one upon whom we build. So I want to kind of take a look at this passage in a little bit more detail. First of all, he starts off this passage helping us understand that the gifts that God has given us by his grace are to be used to glorify him. In the very first portions of verse 10, he says there, according to the grace that God has given me. So, get, so understand this, but what I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with my personal abilities. It doesn't have anything to do with what I can do for the kingdom of God on my own accord. The things that I'm going to be sharing with you are going to be things that God has already deposited in me only by his grace yes. and by his power. It's not about my ability. It's not about how good of a communicator I am. It's not about how much information I've got stored up in here that I might be able to educate you with. He's saying that first and foremost, it's understand that I'm operating according to the grace that God has given me. There's two types of grace that are involved here. First, we see the grace that's received at the cross. Right? That, that's where it began, because apart from that relationship beginning, Paul would have not had any real significant impact for the kingdom. It first required him to receive a deposit of God's grace in his own life before God could exhibit his grace through his life. So the grace starts by being received at the cross, but then he's also referring to a grace that's bestowed upon him through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk a lot more about that when we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, many moons from now, okay? Um, but we need, to, we, we need to make sure we understand that Paul, in what he is about to say, because if you don't understand that he's talking about God's grace in his life, one could begin to think he's being a little boastful here. Because right. what's the very next thing he begins to talk about? Talk about being a skilled master builder. And that he is one. So, but he wants us to understand it's I'm only that because of what God has done in me. Day after day, we've got the opportunity to lay up treasures in heaven. Day after day, we have the opportunity to invest in things that are eternal. But unfortunately, I think most days, we focus on the temporal rather than the eternal. And it's not that we can ignore those things. You know, there are things in the temporary that we do need to pay attention to. But too many times we allow that to steal away most of our focus, rather than making sure that the eternal is the majority of our focus. Every day that we live for ourselves, rather than living for the Lord, we actually abandon eternal crowns that we have the chance to achieve. Right? And, and we see a picture of that in Revelation, where we see crowns being laid at the feet of Jesus. We're going to have the ability to lay our crowns before him one day. The question is, will you have one? Will you have two? Will you have five? Will you have ten? 
that you'll be able to give, that you'll be able to lay at his feet. If we believe that we indeed cast crowns and offer our treasures to God at the feet of the Savior, do you think that that might cause us to focus more on attaining a little bit more? Not for our glory, but so that we have more to give him Amen. in that day. Fortunately, Paul gives us a reminder of what is to come for the believer. He, he lets us know that there are going to be some rewards dished out. Not that that's the motivation behind why we do what we do. Our ultimate motivation is understanding that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us first, and now we choose to love him. And that is what needs to drive us. And as we do that, his grace abounds more and more and more in our lives. But he goes on to say there in verse 10, that as a skilled master builder, that he does a number of things, that he builds on a foundation, that he's laid a foundation, that others actually come and build upon it. But let me ask you, what does it mean to be a master builder? I, what, what does it really entail? And because it's not really a term we use a lot today. It, it's kind of gone by the wayside. It was a real bit big back in history, and especially back in Jesus' day, it was a very common term. But today we use terms like architect, engineers, right? Things of that nature. We don't hear many times about a master builder. So what is one? Well, he was just that. He was a precursor to architects and engineers. But he was better than that because he was both. A master builder wasn't just the architect, he was the engineer. Historically, he was considered the central figure that ensured that quality construction work would actually take place. He had an in-depth knowledge of how to use various construction materials. He knew when to use the concrete, he knew when to use the steel, he knew when to use you know, the stone or the wood. He crafted designs, he directed the work, and often participated in the manual labor. He did everything from start to finish. There was no aspect of construction that he did not know. But he was involved, again, in crafting the design, developing the blueprints, and actually um, directing the work, getting the process going, but then he rolled up his sleeves and he got dirty too. They covered design, engineering, and on-site construction. They laid the groundwork for project success by developing designs and then translating those things into models and specifications. How many know Paul did that yeah. when it came to discipleship? Mm -hmm. I mean, he not only knew what was needed, he knew how to tell them how to get what was needed. And then he was willing to actually get in the trenches with them and help them. Discipleship is ultimately what we are called to do. And in the body of Christ, no matter who you are, we all need to understand this, that if you name the name of Christ, if you are a believer, a follower of Jesus, you are a minister. That's right. Mm -hmm. This is not up for discussion. This is not up for debate. I might be up behind the, pla the, the podium here. But you know what? I am a minister just like you. This is just how God has chosen to use me. But how is he choosing to use you? Is he choosing to use you in the local church? Is, is he choosing to use you to head up, or wanting you to maybe step in and, and head up some sort of a ministry here? Maybe he's calling you outside of this, as he has done with some people in this body that have answered that call and have actually started some extra church um, organizations. Maybe it is just in your neighborhood. Maybe it's just in your place of employment where God is choosing to have you minister and realize that everything that we do is worship and is actually ministering to him, not to those necessarily around us. Um, Dad and I we were talking this week, I think it was during um, the Bible study this week, our Wednesday night um, group, that Dad had mentioned about a book called Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, who was a monk. Um, many years ago, and he understood that, you know what, my job is to do dishes here in this monastery, but even though that doesn't sound super spiritual, I realize that everything, every dish I wash, I'm washing for Jesus. 
you know, and, and do we have that same mentality that everything that we do is unto the Lord, it is for his glory. It is not about what we see in the natural. I have run into so many people, in fact, I was one at one point, where I found myself, and I've heard this so many times from people, I wish there were other Christians where I work. It seems like every job I get, I am the only believer. Well, duh. You know, why would God need to put you in a place where there's already 10 or 20 people following Jesus, willing, able to get that testimony? Wouldn't it make more sense if he would put you where there is no light? Amen. To be the light? If you've ever been in a pitch dark room where, where there's some candles lit, you put another candle with them, you know what? It, it shines. But if you take a candle as small and insignificant as this, or even a big lighter, and you go into a room that's pitch black, you've ever noticed how much light that gives off? It has a lot more impact than it does when it's just around a bunch of other lights. And it's the same way with the body of Christ. We will have a lot more impact when we allow ourselves to get into the dark places. And when we allow God to use us in those dark places. Your place of work may be your mission field. That's right. Your community might be your mission field. The church itself might be where God wants you to spend the most majority of your time. But the key thing is, is wherever it is you're meant to go, do what God's called you to do. And the one thing you've really got to be about doing is what Paul was about doing, and that's realizing God has called you there to be a master builder. Now, how many feel like they're qualified for that? I don't. I don't feel qualified for that role in this position I'm in, but you know what? That's good because it keeps me dependent upon him. And it keeps me ready to keep growing and keep maturing in those things and allowing him to teach and train me. But you know what? We all have the call that we need to start getting a vision for what God wants to do through us in the lives of others. Understand the design that God has for you. Realize that as long as you're sucking air, as the old phrase goes, God still has a purpose for you. God still wants to use you. We have living proof of that right up here on the front row. When people want to say, and even when he would have a tendency to want to say, as you heard him testify last week, when he looked at God and said, have you looked at me lately? You know, do you realize who you're asking to use? And God said, hey, I know full, I'm fully aware, but I will source you. And we need to all carry mentality wherever we are. And which brings us into verse 11. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. When we begin to realize that it's not up to us to have to figure it all out. Jesus already has, by the way. Amen. Now, he might not let you know the whole picture today. He might only let you know page one. But it's like a pastor that we had a visit us once that was a, a good mentor to us. And I was like... You know, I feel like God wants to do this, but you know, I just don't know where he's leading from there. And he's like, can I ask you an honest question in love? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, have you taken that first step? And I'd say, well, no, I've been kind of waiting for steps two and three. And he looked at me and said, what good is that you know steps two or three if you haven't taken step one? <laughs> Amen. You know, what's step one that God's called you to? Actually do that. You might not have the rest of it figured out. That's okay. Jesus does. And when it's time for you to know, he will reveal the rest of the picture. Just do what it is he's laid out for you to do. Understand he is your foundation. He is, he is the firm ground under your feet. He is the one that will keep you from falling. He's the one that will keep you from slipping as long as you keep moving when he's moving. Right? What happens if the rocks move and you don't? Blub, 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 right? When he moves, you move. Paul started with the foundation of Christ in his own life and also in the lives of others. It does not pay nor is it useful to build a house before the foundation. Don't try to get everything else figured out until you're sure that you've got the foundation laid right in your own life and that you've begun to lay that foundation in the lives of others. There might be a news flash for you. There's no way we can live truly righteous lives unless, unless we first come to Jesus. Amen. 
But you know what? We need to take that to the next step when we begin to think about those that we're ministering to as well. Why is it that we expect them to start living righteous if they haven't even gotten a relationship with Jesus yet? Mm -hmm. I remember a guy corrected me very sternly once when, you know, there's somebody that I knew and they were living a life that was pretty horrendous. And I was like, and I began praying. It's like, God, I can't believe the way they're living. And, he, and God's answer to me is simply this, so what? He's like, so what if they, get, if they start doing all things right? They're still going to hell. You can do all the right things on the face of this planet. You can live the Bible perfectly. But if you don't have Jesus, it's all for nothing. Because only the relationship will save you. Your religion won't. And so we need to make sure that that foundation is solid. Not just in us, but in others. Don't worry about trying to get people cleaned up. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And I'm not saying God's not going to use you at some point to speak into their lives down the road. But you know what? When I look at Jesus' ministry, the ones he was harsh with was the church. It wasn't the sinners. The sinners, he always had compassion. And he met them where they were at. Do we do that? Or are we just quick to judge? Love them where they are. Then lead them in paths of righteousness. But the first path of righteousness is this. Get to know Jesus. And get your heart right with him. Until that gets done, everything else is not important. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. What was he saying in that? First of all, I said, I'm taking it personally, a personal responsibility and ownership that I need to live my life in a way that you'll want to follow that actually looks like Jesus. So I'm, I'm willing to say that I'm, I'm going to set a bar pretty high for myself. But he was also saying this in that passage, there's times I miss the mark. Don't follow that stuff. He's not saying do as I say, not as I do. Okay, Let, let's understand that. That's not what he's saying, but what he is saying is, I still mess up, but I'm seeking and I'm choosing to be accountable, let you know that my desire, my number one aim is to follow Christ in all things. And as you see me doing that, follow me in that. That is discipleship. And that's how we begin to build things that have eternal value. Because you know what, there's really, and you've heard me say it before, there's really only three things in this world that are eternal. And that's God, his word, and people. And if our lives aren't invested in those three things, everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. So let us make sure we're investing in the right places. Verse 12, to, um, first part of 13, he says, now. Nah. So now we, we know we've got the foundation laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. We need to build our lives upon that. We need to make sure our ministries are built on him, which means we're only going where he tells us to go. Because he is the ultimate master builder, is he not? Yes. And so let's make sure we're following his lead. But then he goes in verse 12 saying, Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. Notice that day is a capital D. Mm -hmm. That's referring to judgment day. Now, interesting thing here is he's at, Paul here is talking about another builder. Because what did he say? Foundation is laid, that's Christ, but another is building upon it. Right? Paul, we know, he went, he's had his habit of starting churches, and then he would turn it over to somebody else to do a lot of the discipleship. He still had his hand in it. He was a master builder. He was still invested in them. But there was another one that was building on the foundation. Those people who take over the work of service are who he's referring to. Now, he then goes on to say that there's many materials that one can use. He actually lists six of them here. He didn't just list two. Did you notice that? And I think that's important for us to understand. In fact, the first three we see are what? Gold, silver, and precious gems. What are the, th what are the second three? Wood, hay, stubble. Let me ask you this, which is more flammable? Group A or group B? <laughs> you know? But notice that there's a lot of things that you can do that will burn up. 
But can I also say this? There's a lot of things that you can do that will have eternal value. And I think that there's sometimes we have a tendency to go with these things that God lays out before us. And some people allow themselves to get crippled in not doing anything because they're waiting for God to show them the one thing that they're supposed to do. And not just the one thing, but the one way to do the one thing. Mm. But yet he lays out for us here three things that one can actually build with that will actually withstand the heat. There are three things here that will actually have value. And that is whether you're working with gold, whether you're working with silver, whether you're working with precious gems. I'm reminded of the parable of the talents. Remember that, that Jesus talked about? To when he gave five, to when he gave two, to when he gave one. To the one that he gave five, he went off, made five more. To the one he gave two, he went off, made two more. Do you ever notice he doesn't tell you how he made them? We don't hear that, well, to make the five, you've got to do X, Y, Z. Or to make the two, you had to do X, Y, Z. The thing is, they went out, they did what they were gifted to do. Because what did it tell us at the beginning of that parable is this. He gave to each according to their ability. He gave to each one. He set them up for success to do those things that God laid out for them. And so understand this. God has made you and fashioned you to be exactly who you need to be to do what it is he's called you to do. Don't worry about comparing yourself to this person or that person because God didn't make you them. Amen. You don't have to be Billy Graham. That job was already taken by Billy Graham. You're not to be Franklin Graham either. How many know Franklin Graham's ministry was a lot different than his stats? But do they both still have a lot of impact on the world yes. evangelistically? Absolutely. What is it that you can do for God? God might give you a general vision, but he's going to say, here's a bunch of materials, now go do it. So go build, go do what it is he's passioned you to do. There might be more than one way to do it. All he cares about is, are you making a difference? Because see, the only, the only person that got in trouble in that parable of talents was the one who only had one, which by the way, was a large sum of money, even that one talent. But what did he do? He simply buried it. He didn't do anything with it that would have any eternal significance. And so it was taken away from him and given to the others. Don't let that be us. Amen. Let us go about investing, doing something with what God's given you. Don't worry about whether it's going to fail or not. If he told you to do it, it's not going to fail. It might not look the way you thought it would look. And it might be a different avenue than you thought it would go, but I will guarantee you this, and I would sell my home for it. If God's called you to it, you're going to succeed at it. Amen. Because he does not let his children down, and he is faithful. Amen? Amen? The day that we read about there is referring to the day of judgment. In he and we see this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It tells us there that to everyone we are destined once to die, and then what? The judgment. Okay, so what is the judgment? Well, it's understanding that there's this thing called the Bema Seat. And I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. But before we go there, I want us to understand this. There's many people in the church that are not living wicked lifestyles. They're, they're striving to live like God wants them to. They may not be involved in homosexuality or adultery or fornication. They may not be drunkards or drug addicts. They may not lie or cheat or steal. They may not spend their time gossiping or slandering their brother. But they're also not being productive for the kingdom of God either. And you know what James 4, 17 tells us? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. It's not just sins of commission, it's sins of omission. Okay, so we need to understand there is a level of judgment that will come even upon Christians. Okay, and he talks a little bit about that. Look at verses 13b to 15. It says, the day, judgment day, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, so what does that tell you? Everything's going through the fire. The good, the bad, and the ugly. 
But if the work that anyone has built on foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So you see, that I want us to understand that we talk about this judgment seat, we're not saying that somehow, you know, if you've named the name of Christ and now all of a sudden you know, you're doing things that maybe just invest in the temporal, that all of a sudden now you're going to go to hell. That's not what it's saying here. But it is saying that your works will be judged. You're, you'll still make it into heaven. But if the things that we invested in are things that are temporal, those things will have no value. And there will be no um, reward based on that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. See, in Paul's day, in each city, there was something called the Bema or judgment seat. I remember an old Petra song called the Bema seat. <laughs> um, don't remember that word, so I just remember the title. But, um, but understand this, it was an actual place. It was a raised platform, usually right in the center of the town. Now at the Bema, announcements were made Judgments were rendered and awards were given. So you see both this aspect that proclamation, but there was judgments and there were rewards. There was punishment as well as benefits that took place at this Bema seat. For some, it was a place of fear and trembling. For others, it was a place of joy and rewards. At the judgment seat, some were rebuked while others were rewarded. And understand that when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be the same way. There are going to be some that that seat is going to be a place of fear and trembling. Those are going to be the people that didn't name the name of Christ here. The people that chose not to follow. And don't shoot the messenger. The word of God tells us. That's going to be a fearful place for them. For those of us that name the name of Christ, we don't need to fear that. Because you know what? The judgment was already claimed for us that know him at the cross 2,000 years ago. That, that, that price has already been paid in. So that's how come we're able to stand before that judgment seat and not have to be in fear. However, maybe there should be a little holy fear. You know? Because there will be a level of reward. And I don't know about you. I, I know there won't be condemnation there. But I don't want God to put the fire to my life. And all I come out with is a piece of gold dust. I want to see some huge nuggets. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to have something that I can then show once it's been put through the fire and say, here God, this is all yours because you're the one that did it anyway Amen. through me. I want to be able to offer that to him and, and I hope that you're the same way. Amen. But we will stand before that judgment seat and we will have the, at the things of our lives judged. But as we said, Romans 8, chapter 1, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But your ministry will be assessed. Let me ask you a question. Even if you're doing some good things, even if you're doing some righteous things right now, are you doing them for the right reasons? Are you doing them as service and worship unto God, or are you doing them to get the strokes? Mm. Are you doing it to get the financial benefit? or something else, or the accolades. The only accolades we should be striving for is to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. That's the only one that matters. I want to be, I, I, I want to experience like Jesus did. I want to hear the voice of God thunder from the clouds and say, this is my beloved son <laughs> in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. Or you're my beloved daughter, you know. If we live our lives for the glory of God down here, one day we'll have cows to cast as his feet up there. We'll, we'll have something of value to be able to bring before our God, but only if we invest it the right way down here. So I guess the real question is, are we building on the right foundation? If fire was put to your life right now, how much would remain? How much would remain? It's not too late to make it count. 
Amen? Amen. I want us to look at quickly, just in closing, verses 16 to 17. Because this is a passage that gets taken way out of context. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. And we hear this taught, and not necessarily in a bad way, it's, it's, it's not unbiblical. But I hear this passage taken out so many times, and I've been guilty of it, I hate to admit, where we use this to tell people why they need to not smoke, not drink, right? Or, or not engage in any kind of bad behavior. But in essence, that's not what it's saying here. What it's really saying is, understand this. Can you get away from you? No. You can't. But you are God's temple. God chooses to reside in holy places. So understanding that everything that we do that is not of God, anything that is disobedient, again, whether it's sin of commission or omission, anytime we do those things, we are literally defiling the temple of God. When we choose not to march in obedience to the things that God lays out for us, whether it be in whatever form of ministry that is, do we understand that that's a form of defiling the temple? When we choose not to live obediently and, and discharge, but I'm not sure I can do it. It's not your call. That was God's call. And the minute God calls, we are called to obedience. And if we choose not to obey, we find ourselves falling in a place of defiling the temple. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that everything that you do or don't do will reflect on Him? That's right. See, I think too many times we as Christians, we tend to overuse and abuse grace. Amen. We tend to abuse that which Paul started off mentioning, that I can only do this by the grace given to me, but yet we turn around and we use that grace as a crutch that, well, He'll just forgive me anyway. Instead of having that kind of holy fear, that holy reverence of understanding that I, everywhere I go, will be taking the Holy Spirit with me. And if I choose to obey or not obey, reflects on his temple. I want to be a temple that's pure. I had a chance of sitting in. And, uh, Dad actually does a group on Tuesday nights online. Um, or, no, Tuesday night? What night was that? Not Tuesday night. That you do your, oh, Friday night, Fresh Encounter. And um, they had about 20 people that show up. And this week they talked about worship, or, or being a house of prayer. And what that really means. And you know, being, and we're going to have to talk about that someday. Because that was rich. I, I really enjoyed that. But in a nutshell, it's this. It's understanding that when he said about being a house of prayer, it wasn't talking about a house of intercession. Because we see prayer, you know, other places where it names off different types of praying and it differentiates between supplication, intercession, and prayer. There are three different things. And prayer actually breaks down to this, worship. It's how I choose to be in the presence and understand his presence with me everywhere I go. God wants us to be a place of prayer. Our, we are, as a temple, we're supposed to be a house of prayer, right? Not a den of thieves. And so if I'm a house of prayer, that means my life is going to be a life of worship. It's going to be a life of service unto God. And if I'm going to be that life of service, it's only going to be as I march in obedience to everything, even the things that scare me, that God wants to lay out. And again, it's realizing, do you really believe that your God's not going to let you fail? Amen. Do you understand that your God is not going to let you down? Because if you do, you can face anything. I dare you to... Be as Joshua had to be. Be strong and of good courage. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go and in whatever you do. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you so much this morning. That Lord, we do not go alone. You are in it with us. You are in the trenches. You are a master builder. You have designed it, Lord. You, you've given us the plans. You have given us the materials that we need. But God, you're also rolling up your sleeves and getting dirty right along with us. So, Lord God, would you help us to march in obedience, knowing that you are at our side, that you will guide us every step of the way. That, Lord, we can lay a right foundation 
upon you, Lord God, that we would also be able to build those things, Lord, that you have called us to do, to actually discharge the calls that you place on each of our lives so, Lord God, we can have a lasting impact in advancing the kingdom in this earth. Not for the rewards we can gain, but, Lord, for the rewards that we can lay at your feet. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.